This is a podcast about how the Russian revolutionary Lenin explained the beginnings of the First World War, of a world in conflagration. But I don't want to start with a quote from Lenin. I want to start with a quote from today. With wars in Eastern Europe and the Middle East already raging, all it would take is a clash in the contested Western Pacific to bring about another awful scenario, one in which intense interrelated regional struggles overwhelm the international system and create a crisis of global security unlike anything since 1945. A world at risk could become a world at war. Now that quote was from no lefty. It was from Professor Hal Brands from Johns Hopkins University in the United States. He was warning of the danger of world war from the point of view of US imperialism. He wrote his article, which was published just in January, essentially warning the United States to prepare for war by increasing its military spending. Now, Lenin wrote about war, and he wrote about imperialism in the midst of the first and greatest conflagration of the 20th century. In 1916, he wrote a pamphlet on imperialism and the underpinnings of war, the issue that dominated all others. War at that point was the central question. And the kind of questions Lenin dealt with were, was it an accidental feature of capitalism? Could it be tamed by the great powers acting in collaboration? How could workers achieve a world without war? And what should socialists say? And while Professor Brands is issuing a call to arms, Lenin issued a call for worldwide workers' revolution. You're listening to The Sound of Solidarity, brought to you by Solidarity. We're a revolutionary socialist group in Australia, and if you'd like to find out more about us, our website is solidarity.net.au. I'm David Glanz, and I'm recording this episode on unceded Wurundjeri land in Narm or Melbourne. Now, in his 1916 pamphlet, Lenin set out to look at the economic roots of imperialism. It's probably useful to start by defining what imperialism is not, because there are some common misconceptions. It is not simply the establishment of colonies by rich, powerful countries. There was certainly a feature of imperialism in the latter part of the 19th century, and in the first half of the 20th century. But today, imperialism shapes our lives, but there are very few formal colonies. Neither is it simply the domination of small countries by big countries. Because while small countries are less powerful in the global system, that implies that there is essentially the possibility of the big countries coming to an agreement for the peaceful plundering of the world. And that wasn't the case in 1916. It's not the case in 2024. So what Lenin argued was that capital had broken out of its national boundaries. That in the 19th century, with the Industrial Revolution, small businesses competed sometimes just within cities, then within regions, and then for national markets. But then for the major industrialist countries, particularly in Western Europe and increasingly in the United States, capitalism was so powerful and uh, so dynamic that it could no longer be contained within the national boundaries. It needed new markets and it needed new sources of cheap materials. And alongside that process, he argued that capitalism was becoming increasingly concentrated into big monopolies, with the banks and industry increasingly becoming intertwined. And so big business, big capital, broke out of its national boundaries and rapidly conquered the global south, using the various nation states and their militaries to facilitate the process. And so in the last 25 years of the 19th century, pretty much the entire world, 
was divided up between the imperialist nations, who clearly made enormous profits on the basis of plundering the natural resources and the cheap labour of the, the countries of what we would now call the Global South. But Lenin emphasised that each imperialist nation was jostling for control over more land, more raw materials, more population, and that meant there was a constant friction between the major powers and therefore the constant risk of war. I think this is maybe the most important quote from that pamphlet on imperialism. Lenin wrote as follows. The characteristic feature of the period under review is the final partition of the globe. Final not in the sense that repartition is impossible. On the contrary, repartitions are possible and inevitable, but in the sense that the colonial policy of the capitalist countries has completed the seizure of the unoccupied territories on our planet. In the future, only redivision is possible. And of course, that redivision could only take place at the point of a bayonet and the barrel of a gun. Redivision would be a process of the great powers testing their powers against their rivals and therefore laying down the constant process, the constant risk of war. Now, the fact that Lenin wrote his pamphlet on imperialism in the first half of 1916 was not a coincidence. In that period, in early 1916, socialists, especially from across Europe, were gathering in Switzerland, initially in the town of Zimmerwald and then a second conference held elsewhere in April 1916 to discuss how to respond to this horrific outbreak of conflict with death on a scale that had never seen before in wartime. And revolutionaries like Lenin were in a minority when they talked about war coming inevitably out of capitalism and drawing the conclusion that capitalism had to be overthrown. Other socialists talked about achieving a so-called honourable peace. The worst of them talked about the defence of the fatherland and justified the war that was taking place. In other words, there was a battle of ideas amongst people who called themselves socialists. And Lenin wrote this. The pamphlet on imperialism was a legal pamphlet and he had to pick his words carefully. But writing for an illegal audience, he could be much more open in what he said. And this is what he said to fellow socialists in April 1916. The present war is an imperialist war. That is, a war born of contradictions on the basis of highly developed monopoly capitalism, which is ripe for transition to socialism. This war is being waged for world hegemony. That is, for fresh oppression of the weak nations, for another division of the world, the division of colonies, spheres of influence, etc. A division in which the old robber powers, Britain, France and Russia, would give up a share of their booty to Germany, a younger and stronger robber power. Consequently, unless a revolution of the proletariat overthrows the present governments and present ruling classes of the belligerent great powers, there is absolutely no possibility of any other kind of peace except a more or less brief armistice between the imperialist powers, a peace accompanied by a strengthening of reactionary forces within the states, an intensification of the national oppression and greater enslavement of the weak nations, a growth in the inflammable material preparing the way for new wars, etc., etc., and Lenin was right on both counts. Firstly, that war opened the way to revolution. First in Russia, at successful for an all too brief period, and then revolutions in Hungary, in Germany, and a revolutionary wave that swept around the world. But unfortunately, in the absence of sustained revolutionary success, he was also right that 
that the First World War could be no more than a brief period before the next and even worse and bloodier World War. The war that broke out officially in 1939, but in many ways began earlier in the 1930s with the civil war in Spain and the Japanese invasion of China. And that war was more brutal, involved more technology, worst weapons, more people died, and of course included the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews and many others who did not fit the racial stereotypes supported by the Nazis. Now what Lenin wrote in 1916 I think is important for understanding the world today. The economy today is overwhelmingly more globalised than it was at the time of the First World War, which was already a period of globalised capitalism. Exports today are more than 40 times larger than they were in 1913. So in other words, capitalism is everywhere and therefore the power of the great corporations which have become more and more monopolised is even greater. So today there are only two companies in the world that make large-bodied domestic aircraft. There are only six companies that dominate oil. Two companies that control 40% of the commercial seed market. And even in the new sectors that have emerged, the cyber sectors, for instance, there are five companies that dominate the digital world, the so-called FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix and Google. So those corporations have a worldwide presence and power, and that's backed up, of course, by the nation states to which they belong. Overwhelmingly, the United States, but also powers like Britain, France and so on. Today there are few formal colonies, but the competition over spheres of influence, over resources, over trade routes has never stopped, and it's absolutely clear that competition is intensifying. That's partly because while some imperialist powers have declined, Russia in particular, which is really only a great power now because of its nuclear arsenal and its uh, large land army, and Japan, which has declined in relative strength. China has arisen as a major competitor to the United States, and economically and increasingly politically and militarily. And in the same way as the contradictions between Britain, Germany, France, Russia, the Austrian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, led to World War I in 1914, those contradictions have led to war in the Ukraine, where the West is fighting a proxy war against Putin's Russia, and there is the ever-present threat of conflict around Taiwan, as America throws resources into encircling China to prevent it from controlling the Western Pacific. I think it's a, a situation that would have been very familiar to Lenin. Now, there are consequences for all of this within the political debate. At the time of the First World War, Lenin and the Bolsheviks like him, who stood up against all the imperialist powers, who argued that revolutionaries had to oppose their own governments, that the main enemy was at home, that internationalism meant opposing the war drive of your own government, those people were in a minority. The majority, even though right almost up to the last minute before war broke out, the majority of socialists had talked about war as a disaster, about the need for international working class uh, unity, about the need for workers to take action against war. Overwhelmingly, they collapsed into jingoism, into nationalism, into support for the war, and argued on very flimsy grounds that their particular nation state was justified in fighting the war. And the tragedy was that as the mass of the socialist leaders lined up behind war, then they took the mass of the socialist workers around Europe and North America in behind them. And Lenin had to argue for the building of a new revolutionary current that would oppose the war on an anti-imperialist basis. Now today, 
we have echoes of all these arguments. We have people who look to the United Nations as the guarantor of peace, who are prepared to accept invasions of other countries, providing the United Nations, which is dominated by the major imperialist powers, particularly on the Security Council, gives its assent. So the United Nations, in the absence of the Soviet Union, gave the go-ahead for war against North Korea in the 1950s. The United Nations supported the invasion of Iraq. And there are people who say if the United Nations supports war, then they will are prepared to support war too. A fundamental mistake. Then there are those who look in a different way to the international community. But the international community is only made up of nation states with all the interests that each of their capitalist class have. There are those who are prepared to go along with war on the basis of humanitarian interests, who supported the invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11 in order to liberate women. 20 years of war meant that every Afghan suffered, but that war was legitimised by people on the left. And then there are those who think just with clever diplomacy, it's possible for the big powers to, to live cheek by jowl. And so, although Morrison was harshly anti-China and created a backlash from the Chinese, many people are very excited by about the way that the Albanese government has made up some of that disagreement with China by kind words, gestures and so on. Well, that might be good for wine exports or lobster exports in the short term, but the idea that it eradicates imperialist rivalry is simply a nonsense. In the middle of this, Lenin was also arguing for national liberation, as we do today as revolutionary socialists. The reason Lenin supported national liberation was not a moral one. He saw the national liberation struggles as central to weakening imperialism. Therefore, supporting national liberation struggles was not just a task for the people oppressed by national oppression, but it was a task for the workers in the imperialist countries. And he wrote about this in the context of the Russian Empire, which was known as the prison house of nations. He argued that the Russian workers could not fight freely for their own, for their own liberation if they went along with the oppression of the Kazakhs or the Georgians or the Ukrainians and so on and so forth. And that argument is just as important for us today. Think of the impact of the Vietnam War on the US and on, on Australia. The United States imperialism, and to a lesser extent Australian imperialism, was substantially weakened by the national liberation struggle of the Vietnamese people. It was crucial that people in the imperialist nations here in Australia supported the liberation struggle of the Vietnamese, supported the National Liberation Front and the Viet Cong, argued against the sending of troops, argued for people to burn their draft cards, because in the process it destabilised our government and the system that our government supported. That was seen most sharply in the United States, where millions of people began to identify as revolutionaries as the war went on, where the soldiers Many of the soldiers in Vietnam effectively ceased to fight, actually turned on their officers, and the United States ruling class became petrified that that kind of instability and that kind of insubordination would feed its way through into the day-to-day -day life inside the United States. So supporting the Vietnamese for the national liberation wasn't just a moral duty, it was a revolutionary duty against our own ruling class. And today, the lesson is clear. We support the struggle of West Papua, not only against the Indonesian government, but against the complicity of the Australian government. We support the fight for freedom of the Kurdish people, not just against the individual governments of the region where Kurdistan is, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, but also against our own governments who are prepared to turn a blind eye to the atrocities being carried out, in particular by the Turkish government 
against the Kurdish people. And above all, the question right in front of us, the question which dominates politics today, is Palestine. Which side are you on? Are you on the side of the oppressed or are you on the side of the oppressor? And it is fantastic that probably billions of people around the world are with Palestine. Millions, tens, millions of people have taken to the streets in one shape or form or another. Rallies, protests, pickets, boycotts to support Palestine. And solidarity is unambiguously with the right of the Palestinians to fight by any means necessary for their liberation. Not just because they are suffering terribly and we want that suffering to come to an end and we want them to be free and we want them to be able to build their own lives and determine their own future, but because we want to see the imperialist powers, above all the United States and Australia, which are backing Israel to the hilt, despite occasionally their crocodile tears, we want to see those imperialist powers weakened. When the Australian government is weakened by a defeat for Israel, that is a victory for the workers in Australia because it means we have more ability to take up the fight over the cost of living, over climate, over First Nations rights against a government that would be much weaker. Now, there are two things that Lenin wrote about in his pamphlet on imperialism, which are either wrong or I think now have become out of date. And I don't want to dwell on this, but Lenin wasn't a god. He made mistakes. And of course, his words have to be judged in the context of the world we're living in today. I think his outright mistake was to argue that the very large profits that the imperialist countries were making at the expense of the colonies of what we now call the global south were being used to bribe a section an upper section of the working class into complicity with imperialism he talked about that layer as the labor aristocracy he said and he was talking about britain for instance he was very scathing of the british working class the lack of class struggle was because that layer of workers had been bought off with the super profits from empire. Now, the reality is that within a few years, we saw that same upper level of the working class, the better paid, higher skilled workers, often in the manufacturing industry, in Russia, in Britain, in Germany, rise up and become the vanguard of the revolution. Far from holding back the revolutionary impulse, it was very often that layer of workers who became the leadership of the struggle. And I think Lenin was wrong because he had very little experience of the trade union movement and had no real analytical understanding of the conservative role that trade union officials can play, despite many of them saying left-wing things and making left-wing speeches. He didn't understand that trade union officials are neither bosses nor workers, but they're intermediaries and they rely on the existence of capitalism for unions to exist and for them to receive their salaries and the like. Lenin really had no awareness of that and therefore I think he made a mistake. The other thing where I think he was not so much mistaken in 1916 but is now out of date is about the question of the export of capital. And he argued that one of the impulses behind imperialism was the drive to export capital from the major imperialist countries to what we would now call the global south in order to be able to exploit the natural resources and the workers and peasants of those regions. Today, the patterns of capital export are very, very different. The problem for the poorest countries today is not that the imperialist nations are pouring capital into their economies in order to exploit them even more heavily. The problem is very often they have no access to capital at all. That in large parts of the global south, in particular sub-Saharan Africa, partial exceptions of South Africa and Nigeria, capital imperialism is largely uninterested 
in investing. There are small pockets of exception, such as uh, mines or plantations. But for the large part, imperialism is not pouring capital into the global south, it's ignoring it. So in 2022, the OECD nations, which are the largest, richest Western industrialized nations, received 840 billion in capital inflows. Sub-Saharan Africa received 30 billion. That's a difference of 28 times. And so what we see is that actually the major imperialist powers today are more likely to invest in their own region, inside the European Union, inside the United States, or its immediate zones of influence, Canada and Mexico, than they are likely to invest in the global south. Okay, let's move on. I think another area where we can, with the benefit of experience, improve on what Lenin talked about is around the topic of sub-imperialism. So Lenin talked about the way that small states were dependent on the major imperialist countries, even though sometimes they had moderately large economies. So he talked, for instance, about South America, where by the beginning of the 20th century, most of the nations of South America were formally independent from colonization, but their economies were still very intermeshed with imperialist economies. And he talked about the fact that China or Turkey, which at that stage was strictly speaking the Ottoman Empire, were countries with some heft, but nonetheless subordinate to the imperialist powers. Today, what we would call sub-imperialism is a much clearer phenomenon, a much more widespread. So sub-imperialist powers are not simply subordinate to the large imperial powers, the large imperial powers that can fight for influence right across the world, that can deploy the military across the world, that can use their economic power to dominate or shape political developments right across the world. There's only a small number of countries in that category. But sub-imperialists are actually capable of exerting power within their own region. And while they may be allied to a larger imperialist power, and they will be weaker than the major imperialist powers, they will sometimes disagree with the larger imperialist powers and create tensions between themselves or between themselves and the major imperialists. So you think of, for instance, the Middle East today. Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, the UAE, they are all substantial powers with large economies, big militaries, in the case of Israel for certain, nuclear weapons, and they are rivals for influence in the region. India and Pakistan, both nuclear armed, not capable at this point of projecting power far beyond South Asia, but rivals within the region for influence. And then you look at the sub-imperialist of greatest interest to us, Australia, uh, a country which dominates the South Pacific, especially the Southwest Pacific, up into Melanesia and in, uh, with influence up into uh, parts of Southeast Asia. Australia is subordinate to the United States. It's allied with the United States but sometimes can disagree with the United States, a point that is often missed. It was only a few weeks ago the United States said to Australia, send us a ship to attack the Houthis in the Red Sea in Yemen. And the Albanese government said no, not because they're pacifists and certainly not because they're in favour of the Houthis or in favour of Palestine, but because Australian sub-imperialism prioritises its control of the immediate region and the Australian government and military forces wanted the Australian ship in this region, not in the Red Sea. And interests can clash between sub-imperialists and their allies in, in all sorts of ways. Uh, when the United States told its allies to stop dealing with Russia over the invasion of Ukraine, Saudi Arabia continued to sell oil. 
Turkey is a member of the NATO alliance, but often operates at contradistinction to the United States over issues in the, in the Middle East. And so development of imperialism more than a hundred years on from when Lenin wrote shows that there are layers of sub-imperialists sometimes going to war amongst themselves, sometimes players in larger imperialist rivalries, not just puppets. So in conclusion, I want to reiterate, I think, Lenin's most important argument. The drive to war is built into capitalist competition on a global scale. Imperialism can sometimes appear to be in a state of stability, something that the rivals, the conservative socialists in, at the time of the First World War toyed around with as, as the idea of super imperialism, that the imperialists were so big, their economies were so enmeshed that they would inevitably find ways of maintaining peace because war was too expensive. That is simply not the case. The United States and China are highly integrated in many ways, both in terms of finance flows and manufacturing exports and imports. But that in no way precludes the very real possibility of conflict up to and including war and the potential of nuclear war. During the Cold War, the wars were tended to be fought in the peripheral zones of imperialism. Mutually assured destruction between the American and Russian empires meant that they were scared of open confrontation. Today, that situation has changed. US imperialism is in decline relative to its competitors. Chinese imperialism is growing in power. Russia has shown that despite its economic weaknesses, it is capable of fighting NATO and its puppets in Ukraine to a standstill. Under those circumstances, the threat of global war, the threat of nuclear war, is very real. And therefore, we need to look back to Lenin one more time, and that is for the solution to a system that breeds war and takes us to the edge of catastrophe and maybe beyond. And Lenin had this to say, imperialism is the eve of the social revolution of the proletariat. This has been confirmed since 1917 on a worldwide scale. In other words, we cannot leave it to the capitalists to save our world and save us from war. These are the people whose interests and drive for profit are pushing us closer and closer to crisis and catastrophe. The solution lies with the working classes of the world standing up to their own governments, especially those of us in the imperialist states, and saying to them, you are threatening the planet, we will take that planet off you, we will make revolution, we will overthrow you. And that's the task to which solidarity is committed. And I call on listeners who agree with this analysis to join us. We need a bigger revolutionary socialist current in this country, laying the basis for a mass party of the future, a mass party of revolutionary workers that will make imperialists tremble. Thank you.